This is Season 2 of Mobile Suit Breakdown, a podcast about Japanese sci-fi mega-franchise Mobile Suit Gundam for new fans, old fans, and not yet fans, where we watch, analyze, and review all 40 years of the iconic anime in the order it was made. We research its influences, examine its themes, and discuss how each piece of the Gundam canon fits within the changing context in Japan and the world from 1979 to today. This is episode 2.18, Gateway to the Stars, and we are your hosts. I'm Tom, I am a lifelong Gundam fan, and this week we are all horrible geese. (laughs) And I'm Nina, new to Zeta, and pleased to finally know the name of the character who inspired my current hair color. Mobile Suit Breakdown is made possible by the support of 251 patrons! That's right! We did it! We broke the 250 milestone! Thank you all, and special thanks go out to our newest patrons, Radar Man, LD Raku, Trey N, and Magnus A. If you'd like to support Mobile Suit Breakdown and get access to our patron discord, bonus content, and more, you can do so at GundamPodcast.com slash Patreon. Before we get started this week, we wanted to let you know that starting November 10th, right after the release of Season 2, Episode 24, we are going to be taking a brief two-week sabbatical from Zeta. We have some long-term projects that need our attention, and we could use the break. But that doesn't mean that you'll be without MSB for those two weeks. In fact, we are planning to put together two special episodes for those weeks, and we need your help making them. The first episode, which we will be publishing on Saturday, November 16th, 2019, will be our first public Q&A episode. So, if you have questions about us, our opinions, the podcast, Gundam, other giant robots, etc., etc., whatever, this is your opportunity to ask them. Send your questions to GundamPodcast at gmail.com before November 2nd and put Q&A in the subject to make it easier for us to find them. The week after that, the second episode will be what I am calling a forum episode. Over the past 60-some weeks, we have offered you our Gundam opinions. And now we want to hear yours. Did we have some hot takes that you just can't accept? Do our theories contradict the deep Gundam lore? Did we miss some crucial details in one of our research pieces? Worse, did we make a mistake? Were we too hard on Hayato? Do you have a thousand word treatise on why Kai is not the best character? Did Camille deserve anything that happened to him? Send your thoughts and your opinions our way. We will discuss our favorites on the podcast and hey, you just might convince us. You should send your comments and corrections to GundamPodcast at gmail.com before November 10th with forum in the subject. And then we will resume our regular coverage of Zeta Gundam on November 30th with episode 2.25. You will see the tears of time. And now back to episode 2.18. This week we are covering Zeta Gundam episode 17, Hong Kong City, or in the Japanese, Hong Kong City. It's just Hong Kong City, but in Japanese. After the recap and our talkback, our research for this episode covers Hong Kong and brain-computer interfaces. But first, we have the Titans News Network to remind you what happened last week. Welcome back to TNN. I am TNN meteorologist Lieutenant Nina Nina's daughter, and this is Fog Watch 87. Southern California remains shrouded in unusually dense fog today, and the Federation Weather Service is advising everyone to avoid the area due to safety concerns. We go live now to the TNN special weather correspondent, Tom Thompson, on the ground near Vandenberg Air Force Base. Hello, Tom. Tom, are you there? Uh, yes. Yes, I'm, I'm here, sorry. The fog appears to be interfering with our communications somehow. 
It, it's definitely the fog, uh, not Minovsky particles, because uh, there, there aren't any Minovsky particles here, no Minovsky particles at all. Why would there be? <laughs> that, that would be ridiculous. Glad to hear it, Tom. How's the weather down there? Well, it is very foggy. Visibility is limited to about uh, a meter. The wind isn't too bad down here, protected as we are by the Earth's loving embrace, but higher up in the atmosphere there is a lot of hostile cold air coming down from the north near the former San Francisco region, and it is mixing with the local air causing turbulence and some strange auditory phenomena. Locals here are saying that this is the worst fog they can remember, and that it is really making it hard to tell who your friends are. One local resident told me that he saw a child barely 15 years old pointing a handgun at his mentor due to the confusion of the fog. Wow, that sounds ominous. We've also been hearing reports from people seeing flashes in the fog that look like gunfire and explosions. Have you seen anything like that? Uh, that's a very common optical illusion that you see with this kind of fog all the time. It's uh, similar to an aurora borealis, but at this time of year, at this latitude and localized entirely within the fog above Hickory. It's usually a sign that someone has been looking up at the sky for too long, and they should probably go back inside and focus on their work. What about reports of loud noises reminiscent of gunfire, explosions, and the propeller of a biplane? Ha ha ha, just tricks of the wind, I'm afraid. As a reporter, you can trust that I would love to report on a story about the heroic titans destroying AUG terrorists in battle over fog-shrouded hickory. I'd probably win a Pulitzer for that kind of reporting. But unfortunately, no such thing happens here. It's merely a coincidence of totally normal natural phenomena, combined with irresponsible hype from the mainstream media that led some gullible minds to just invent a ridiculous hoax. It's like Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, or new types. What a relief. Next up, an exclusive TNN investigative report. Is he suitable for you? I share my one weird trick for inciting a man to action and what to do if it turns out he doesn't have what it takes. And now the recap for Hong Kong City. Taking over for the fallen Blutark, Lieutenant Ben Wooder orders the Sudori across the Pacific and sends a message to the Murasame lab in Japan requesting reinforcements. On the Adumla, Hayato, Camille, Amuro, and Beltorchka discuss their next move. Amuro thinks they should attack the Titan's base at New Guinea. It's new, and they won't have solidified their defenses yet. It's also likely to have shuttles, and an attack there would raise Ayug's profile. After all, if they die without making all of humanity aware of Ayug and its goals, what's the point? But before they can attack, they will need supplies. Kai contacted them with information on a potential supplier, Luo Wumin. So they set a course for New Hong Kong. Camille is working on the Mark II when Beltorchka comes to talk to him. She begins to make small talk, but Camille snaps at her. What do you want? I'm busy. So she cuts to the chase. Amuro is the more experienced pilot, and a hero of the One Year War. He should be the one piloting the Gundam Mark II. Did he tell you to say that? Camille asks her angrily. Of course not, she laughs. She asks if Camille hates Amuro, if that's why he won't give up the Mark II. Piloting a Gundam would give Amuro more confidence. I don't hate him, but this isn't really about Amuro being a better pilot for the Mark II. You just pity him, and pity like that will get him killed. When Camille tries to leave, Beltorchka grabs hold of his shoulders, but he brushes her off, leaving her standing on the Mark II. The shipments from the Murasame lab arrive at the Sudori. Shuttle boosters and a mobile suit so large it can't even fit in their hangar. Accompanying the massive mobile suit are Namikar Cornell, head instructor of the Murasame Laboratory, and Ensign 4 Murasame. When Wooder goes to greet them, 4 makes a request that once she leaves on a mission, she will not be subject to anyone's orders. If she is not free to act as she thinks is best, she will return to Japan. Namikar seems shocked, but Wooder puts a hand to 4's cheek and looks at her closely. Very well, do as you wish. In New Hong Kong, the Adumla lands on the water and is inspected by local authorities. Camille stares out the window at the beautiful city, thinking about how different it is from the colony he grew up on. 
Amaro and Beltorchka head out in civilian clothes to the main office of Luo and Co, where the waiting room is packed with people trying to catch shuttles off of Earth. With a start, Amaro recognizes someone in the crowd. Mirai Yashima! Mirai Noah, now, with her and Bright's children, Chaemin and Hathaway. They are on the waiting list for a black market flight to space. Even though it's unlikely they'd be able to reunite with Bright right away, Mirai and Bright both want to raise their children in space. Won't you be going back there? Mirai asks Amuro. He looks at Beltorchka and changes the subject. But there's no time to catch up. Amuro needs to find their contact. Shoving his way to the front of the line, he asks to speak to Luo Wumin. The employee at the counter looks back at a woman in a red suit sitting at a large desk. A security guard walks over and punches Amuro in the stomach and face, knocking him over a bench. People scream and scatter, and Amuro tells Beltorchka to run before throwing himself back at the guard, knocking the guard to the ground. He's punching him in the face when another guard pulls him up and throws him across the room. Yet another guard tries to stop Beltorchka and Mirai from leaving, but Beltorchka knees him in the groin and they run through the door. Out in the street, Mirai suddenly stops in her tracks. A massive, dark ship is descending on the city, the mobile suit from Murasame Lab. Piloted by four, the mobile suit's wings crunch through windows as it flies low through the streets, sending pedestrians screaming and scrambling for cover. She is hunting the Mark II. The crew of the Audumla have noticed the ship, but are unable to identify it. It's too big to be a mobile suit, and is like nothing they've seen before. Camille and the Mark II are ready, so Hayato orders Camille to launch. On the bridge of the Sudori, Namikar tells Woodard this will be Four's first combat. It's possible she will experience a mental breakdown and become just as dangerous to her allies as she is to her enemies. It seems that cyber new types are still in the testing stages. Flying in on a Dorai, Camille spots Four's machine, wondering why someone would choose to fight in a city. The black ship fires countless rays from two dishes on its front. The Mark II is forced to abandon its Dodai to dodge them, and is still knocked to the ground. When Four spots the Mark II, her eyes flash red and Camille is overcome by a sensation of malice. On the street, Mirai feels it too, as does Amaro, lying in a cell. Amaro is certain the sensation isn't Camille, and is trying to figure out who it is when the woman in the red suit comes to the door. Why do you need to speak to Luo Wumin, she asks. Why do you need to speak to my father? Amuro tries to speak but winds up clutching his injured ribs. We have to detain anyone who asks for my father by name like that. Here in Hong Kong City, we can never be sure who our enemies are. I represent my father. I take it that Karaba is... Before she can finish, the whole building is shaken. They both stagger over to the window, trying for a glimpse of the battle. Explosions flash in the distance and they both leave, recognizing it is too dangerous to stay where they are. Outside, Camille moves cautiously. When he fires directly on the black ship, it takes no damage at all. It has some sort of barrier against beam weapons. When Four moves in, he darts out of the way, landing on top of the mobile suit and grabbing hold of its head or cockpit. You call yourself human? Stop attacking indiscriminately, Camille yells, before is only incredulous at an enemy giving her orders. She throws the Mark II off, and they take to the sky, the black ship firing its massive beams and the Mark II dodging as quickly as it can. Beltorchka, Mirai, and the children arrive at the Audumla. Hayato can't quite figure out what the enemy is trying to achieve, and orders two Nemos out to support the Mark II before taking the Audumla up into the air. It is all Camille can do to avoid the Black Machine's attacks, and Four laughs from within her cockpit. The Black Machine transforms into a mobile suit, one bigger than any we've ever seen. It's the height of a skyscraper and towers over the Mark II, where it hides down a side street. Camille continues to dodge, but each attack destroys more of the city. Leaping upwards, he attempts an attack with his beam saber, but still can't get through the Black Machine's defenses. Back and forth they fight, with the Mark II unable to damage Four's mobile suit, Four constantly swatting away but failing to take out the Mark II, and the city of Hong Kong being gradually destroyed around them. This is the famous Mark II? Four laughs to herself. It's nothing but a doll! The Nemos arrive, and she quickly blasts them from the sky, but there is a tremor in her voice now, and trembling in her hands. They're... they're only... dolls. Four is beginning to tire, and wonders at Camille's vitality. Camille thinks if he can just hit the eyes of the black ship, he might be able to stop it. As he strikes, everything seems to go blue. There's a flash, and he slices across, but not quite through, the black machine's chest. 
What is this rough sensation? I, I feel sick, Four stammers, terrified, before suddenly jutting away. Camille, panting, wonders why she ran all of a sudden. On the Sudori, Warder demands to know why Four didn't finish off the Mark II. She replies angrily, Only someone who has piloted the Psycho Gundam would understand. That sensation, that feeling of a snake writhing in your head. Once it's all over, Stephanie Wumin, Luo Wumin's daughter, sees that the Audumla gets the supplies it needs. Beltorchka sits with Mirai and the children and asks about Mirai's husband. Is he in space? Mirai tells her that Bright has been frustrated almost since the last war ended, and he's finally able to release that frustration in space. That's nice for him, but hard for you, the wife left behind on Earth. But Mirai truly doesn't mind. She understands Bright completely and has no anxieties. Isn't it better for children to grow up with their parents, Beltorchka pushes? Mirai admits that of course it is, but that she is able to model Bright for them, to keep him present and real in their minds. To Beltorchka, this sounds like an excuse. Still, Mirai insists that through her and Bright's trust for each other, he can still be a presence in the lives of his children, even though he's far away. In the hangar, Amuro and Camille discuss the sensation that emanated from the enemy mobile suit. Amuro is especially anxious to get Camille to space now. If he can sense the enemy that way, he will become a very valuable pilot for Ayuk, and it's easier to see and understand the situation on Earth from outer space. Just don't make the mistake I did. This thing called gravity has a way of dragging your soul into the depths of the Earth. But isn't it Earth that gave us our souls, Camille replies? Amuro sighs. Yes, that's another way of looking at it. Tom surprised me a little bit this episode. Uh, we were planning out everything we wanted to talk about in the episode, and he says, Hong Kong. And I'm like, what about it? And he's like, it's practically its own character. <laughs> <laughs> it is. What is it about Hong Kong that makes Camille go, wow, this place is great. This is amazing. What we're really looking at is, for one thing, the biggest city we've been in so far in Zeta. So it's going to be the most populous. It's going to have the most going on. It's a beautiful city. If their new Hong Kong is like Hong Kong now or the Hong Kong of the 80s, you know, the contrast of the tall buildings, the traditional ships, there is a junk in the harbor, as Tom pointed out to me, uh, surrounded by, you know, beautiful green hills and mountains right on the ocean. It is aesthetically very beautiful. It has that mix of both Western and Chinese styles and people and writing. There's a mixture of English and also Chinese characters. And for lack of a more succinct way of putting it, we see crime here in a way that we do not see it in any other setting in Zeta. The black market, what appears to be some gambling or at least someone being shaken down for gambling debts. And it's not hidden at all. It's all very out in the open for all that it is criminal and black market. When Hayato wants to know where to find Luo for, <laughs> for some uh, shady black market weaponry and equipment, he asks the government officials who have just told him that weapon sales are illegal. Right? That's so great. It's like, we just need to tell you we're not allowed to sell you weapons. And Hayato's like, yep, yep, that's great. I'm totally down with that. By the way, where's the black market? Where's this company that famously deals with black market shuttle tickets and weaponry and supplies and God knows what else? And the officials, we can presume, are just like, oh, yeah, of course. Just take a left at Gambling Alley and then go down Illicit Drugs Way until you get to Arms Manufacturer Plaza. They give him a little bit of a scowl, <laughs> but they still tell him. And I don't think you're being flip when you talk about illicit drugs and stuff. A big organization like that that's already involved in illegal human trafficking, basically, you know, illegal transport of people and weaponry and war supply probably is involved in drugs and gambling and some violence and, you know, yeah. the whole gamut. They have a couple of big enforcers at the Luo and company offices who beat Amaro up. They throw him in a jail cell. They have their own cells. 
And that's technically kidnapping, what just happened there. Right. They don't call the local police about some guy making trouble in their office. They beat him up and they throw him in their private prison. <laughs> yeah. This is a world where the line between legitimate authority and illegal authority is fuzzy. It's also a vibrant, living city, one that is organically constructed over a long period of time. It's full of people who are dressed in a variety of different outfits that suggest a range of different socioeconomic statuses. There are a lot of poor people on the streets of New Hong Kong in a way that, say, Green Oasis did not have. Yeah, we know that there is an underground press in Green Oasis because Camille mentions it. Presumably there are other illegal activities going on. Anywhere you have people, you're going to have that. But there is this veneer of orderliness <laughs> over everything. The other sense that we get from the colonies is that they were planned and built in a lot of ways to facilitate the exercise of like intense government control. Mm -hmm. And it's also pretty and it's manicured lawns, it's big suburbs. There's a elite private college and everyone's lounging around in their gymnastics wear or their tennis whites. It's all very Western and very waspy and very wealthy. We see a few overhead shots of the residential area and the houses are all about the same size. It's very homogenous, whereas the more organic cities on Earth really defy attempts to do that. It feels less veneered. Like mm -hmm. we see more of what's happening there. Yeah. Less is hidden from us. It does feel more honest. A lot of that's just it being busier too. I mean, mm -hmm. within that one city, they probably have more people than lived on the whole colony that Camille grew up on. That could very well be the case, yeah. Which is a thing I always think about in New York when people talk about crime or homeless people or other sort of societal issues. I'm like, well, but you have to remember there are 9 million people here. Right. <laughs> On a per capita basis, it's probably not that much worse than wherever you're from, <laughs> but how many millions of people live where you're from. And it's not as though the apparent cleanliness of the environment reflected any kind of superiority in the people. The show goes out of its way to show us that the people living on Green Noah are not like good people necessarily. The ones that we see besides Camille and Fa and Fa's mother tend to be violent and cruel. You've got Camille's father, who's an absolute piece of work, Camille's mother, who's neglectful, the karate club member who backhands him. Mm -hmm. The point of all of this is that, as you very nicely put it, there's a veneer over everything that hides a lot of ugliness underneath the surface. And here everything feels more out in the open. And the characters that we're meeting here are a little rougher, a little prickly, but I think we're meant to like them more. So you mentioned clothes earlier, and I just want to bring up, we see a bunch of the crew in street clothes, trying not to look conspicuous. Amro is wearing a polo shirt and slacks and a pair of sunglasses. But then we have Bell Torchka, <laughs> who is the only person in the entire episode we see wearing what you might call traditional dress. She's wearing a chipao. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that badly. It's Q-I-P-A-O is how it's usually written in English. Uh, it's the... Somewhat traditional Chinese dress with the high collar, no sleeves, slitted sides of the skirt. Do you think she bought that or did she have it in her bag? She probably went out and bought it. Uh, she's the only person we see in the entire episode dressed this way. And it feels very touristy <laughs> for this white, blonde haired, blue eyed woman <laughs> to, be, to have just arrived in Hong Kong and to immediately have gone out and bought this dress and be running around in it. Yeah. It almost feels more conspicuous, though. Oh, yeah. She's not blending in at all. We spotted a Bandai billboard. While the two mobile suits were fighting, just throwing a little extra sponsor love in there. We should go back through this episode frame by frame and look at all of those signs, because I bet that was not the only amusing Easter egg on the streets of New Hong Kong. You are probably correct. Speaking of which, we don't know why they call it New Hong Kong some of the time and Hong Kong the rest of the time. I assume Hong Kong got destroyed and rebuilt. That seems reasonable. They don't really go into it. It gives every indication of being in the place where Hong Kong is right now. Mm -hmm. It occupies the same space. This is not a York, New York kind of situation. Although that would sort of poke holes in our argument about the organic old city. <laughs> 
If the whole thing has been entirely rebuilt in the last decade. Maybe they just call it New Hong Kong to make it more future-y. They rebuilt it, but they rebuilt it exactly as it was. <laughs> they didn't change a thing. I mean, they were all landmark buildings. You have to put them back the way they were. Part of the reason I wanted us to talk about Hong Kong City is Stephanie Luo's line about Hong Kong when she's talking to Amuro and she's explaining why they had to beat him up when he showed up at their offices asking for Luo Wu Min. She says, this is Hong Kong. We never know who our enemies are. And I've brought this up before. I think that is one of the main running themes throughout Zeta is never really knowing who your enemies are even when they're wearing Titan's uniforms. You never know when you're going to encounter somebody who's really like Emma. It implies that, in Hong Kong at least, the battle lines are not yet distinct. <laughs> that there aren't clear sides. This line really ties back into our discussion of the black market earlier, into our discussion of how this represents an environment that is more difficult to control. This is not a place where you can necessarily trust like, oh, the police are on my side or this other gang is on my side or this particular group. Those alliances are constantly shifting. In a place with a thriving black market, there's probably a lot of bribery being paid, but to who? And who's trying to get rid of the black market and who supports it? And who supports it, but only on the sly? And who's funding both sides? And and who's in the Titans, but is really sympathetic to Ayug? And who is in Ayug, but is really a warlike person with no compunctions about the costs of this revolution? Which Federation soldiers are actually on Ayug's side and which ones are not? And what about all those other factions on the outside? The Republic of Xeon, whoever's out in the asteroid belt. So in this way, Hong Kong really serves as a microcosm for Zeta as a whole. There are factions and lines, but individual loyalties are slippery. It's not like in First Gundam, where you have one or two traitors to the Federation, and that is a major plot point worth playing out over four or five episodes before we get to the revelation of General Elrand's deceit. This is a scenario where no one can really ever be certain about anybody. When Amaru and Biltorchka arrive in the waiting room of the big Luo and Co. main office, it's packed already. There are people sleeping on the floor, most of whom are talking about trying to get shuttle tickets off-world. They're trying to get shuttles out into space. We know that there's a large degree of government control over the movement of people between Earth and the colonies and back. And even between parts of Earth, it sounds like. Like, it was difficult for Amuro to get tickets to Japan for Fra and the kids. Uh, so there's a lot of very tightly controlled movement of people, but there are some black market flights that get out, apparently. And these people are all desperate to be on them. And to me, the tone of voice of the people in the room, the delivery of the lines about, I've been here two days. I do, this is a legitimate ticket. I have all my paperwork. Speaks to some desperation, which makes me wonder, what are these people trying to get away from or to desperately get to? But I get much more of a get away from vibe. To our knowledge, the fighting has not yet touched Hong Kong at the beginning of the episode. Not until four rolls in with the Psycho <laughs> Gundam. So what is everybody so afraid of? What is everyone so desperate to get away from? I get the feeling there aren't many opportunities to get off of Earth, if that's something you want to do. The difficulty of getting off of Earth has been the main driving motivation for all of our AUG heroes since they arrived on Earth. And Mirai and family traveled halfway around the world to get here. So if there was an easier way off of Earth, they probably would have taken it. But as for all of the other people in the Luo and company offices, part of me thinks this is just the regular, normal, natural desperation of those people who need to get somewhere else for work or because their family is in space or because they're trying to get away from the law. But then again, if there's a war brewing in space between Earthnoids and Spacenoids... And the last time there was a war between Earthnoids and Spacenoids, the sky fell. Some people might not want to be on Earth when the war gets serious. This just popped into my head, but I'm also suddenly thinking about a lot of the European migration to the United States back in the day. 
So we were just out sightseeing with my folks and we didn't actually go to Liberty Island, but we were at another island nearby and got a very good look at it and Ellis Island and so on. You know, why did anybody come over? There were no jobs or there was persecution. A similar situation could be happening on Earth. There could be a shortage of jobs for people. The economy could be bad. Uh, you know, we are used to thinking of the people who live on Earth as elites, but... That's clearly not true for most of the people living in Hong Kong. <laughs> Zeta is not showing us a future where tasks like cleaning <laughs> and <laughs> trash removal and cooking are fully automated. There are people doing those things. Right. You're always going to need somebody to clean your mansion. And if there's a sense that there are greater opportunities in space, if you can get there then that might well lead to a lot of desperate people willing to shell out and risk themselves in black market transport to get there. So we were going to talk about the Titans and yeah. uh, four. And Camille and the Psycho Gundam. <laughs> we are running through antagonists at what I think is a unsustainable rate. It's true. We lost Blutark and Rosamia. Now we have Wooder and Four. Wooder, who was only introduced last episode, even though presumably he's been on the ship since Blutark took control of it. Wooder also ignoring the orders that Blutark received and taking the Sidori across the Pacific. Like a good Gundam subordinate, he's doing it to get revenge for the death of his superior officer. And as I mentioned in the intro, we finally know the name of the character who my current hair color was inspired by, For Murasame. Who is very cool. Also creepy. Yes. Strong villain vibes. <laughs> Just a lot of evil laughing. She glows red. And their eyes flash red. Yeah, I don't know a lot of non-villainous characters who glow red and have red flashing eyes. She also does a lot of lines about how pitiful her enemy <laughs> is, how weak they are. And how their mobile suits are just like dolls. They're not even people, they're just dolls. Oh, so let's backtrack a second. <laughs> when they start fighting in Hong Kong, Camille's reaction is, you call yourself human? How could you do this? And what he means is, how could you pick a fight in the middle of this massive city? You could have fought me anywhere. Here, a bunch of civilians are going to die. Right. He doesn't know he's fighting a cyber new type. Maybe she doesn't consider herself human. It's quite possible the people who train and deploy her don't consider her fully human. It's like a, an interesting second level of meaning. Yeah. But I want to look back even a little bit further to Wooder again, because boy, is he a nothing of a character. There's just like no characterization for him whatsoever, except his kind of weird looking face. He's sandy haired. I don't think we have many sandy haired. That's true. Characters. And his inappropriate touching. This reminded me a lot, actually, of Rosamia and Blutark, only he's the one who initiates it, not four. Four makes a frankly inappropriate request. Once she's out in battle, she says, I don't want to be under anyone's orders. I want to be free to do what I think I need to do. Otherwise, I'm going back to Japan. Pay attention to that because that is Four's character in a line. And he kind of comes up to her. And the impression I got was of like really looking at and analyzing her face. Like when someone says something to you that makes you stare right at them, like you're trying to get a sense of the person just by looking at their face and at their eyes, you know? Only he ac accompanies this with a, a sort of like hand at her cheek. And whatever he sees there, he decides, okay, sure, do what you want. <laughs> I thought it was a meaningful gesture because for most characters in Zeta Gundam, the superior officer would have responded to that with a slap across the face. Not a like caress, a weirdly affectionate, creepy caress, brushing the fingertips along the jawline. She doesn't betray any reaction. For four, this is just what people do. She is accustomed to superiors in the military messing with her body in one way or another. Like, I don't know exactly what goes into cyber new type training or cyber new type manufacture, but one gets the sense that four doesn't have a lot of physical or psychological autonomy. Yeah, I was going to say she doesn't necessarily have a sense of bodily autonomy. And maybe that's why she's so insistent that once she goes into battle, she'd be allowed to do as she pleases. 
I think it has more to do with the fact that, and we see this when she comes back from the fight, and they're like, why didn't you finish him off? You were winning the whole fight. She is very insistent that because they have never piloted the Psycho Gundam, they cannot possibly understand what she experienced out there. And this is one of the first times we get a sense that it's not just the fight for her. In the Psycho Gundam, there is a great deal of mental energy being expended. There is a mental battle alongside the physical. Well, she describes it as like a snake writhing around in her head. See, I thought her that was her reaction to Camille's attack. Mm. Uh, but she does comment on Camille's vitality, that he does not seem as tired piloting the Mark II as she is piloting the Psycho Gundam. And we know from Lala that there are ways to make mobile suits, mobile armors, etc., more sort of connected to new type abilities, make them so they can better take advantage of those new type abilities, but that this is intensely mentally draining for the person doing it. The original Gundam design and I think the Mark II, based on what we've seen so far, are not made to exploit <laughs> that particular ability. They're just made to be piloted. The benefits you get from being a new type are incidental in a lot of ways. Uh, the machine does not connect with that in any way. And so not only is she being exposed to those mental energies, which we see some back and forth there, right? With her first red-eyed flash of malice, Camille, Amuro, and Mirai all feel it <laughs> and go, whoa, what was that? <laughs> Uh, but then when Camille spots his opening and takes that attack, she feels it. Not only does she feel it, we can see in the animation it's like Camille is firing a pulse out of his brain that's hitting her. Well, let's, let's break down the visual depiction of that moment because it's very interesting. Her flash of malice makes everything red. Her eyes flash red and then Camille, as he's drawn, goes like red and gray and it's kind of cross-hatched in places. When he has his moment of insight, everything goes blue and loses some detail and there's a flash, like the new type flash that we've talked about before, that runs through him and then to her. Also, briefly, both of them look nude. I mean, it's just an outline. It's not explicit or anything, but their normal suits seem to disappear. Yes. There's a sense that in his moment, things are being stripped away. And she seems briefly stunned by this new type of pulse. Yeah, much more so than by the attack, because while he does manage to cut the front of where I think the cockpit is, he doesn't get through it. He, in fact, cuts directly over where the heart would be if this were a person. But he doesn't break through. She's in no physical danger. But she's tired and she's frightened. She's pouring sweat. She's like, I didn't know an enemy could feel like that. And that's when she runs. That's when she's like, I'm done. <laughs> I'm out of here. Well, the Psycho Gundam has some kind of beam deflection shield. It works both against long range beams, the way the beam deflection shield on the Big Zam works. But it also seems to work against Camille's beam saber. The couple of times he tries to cut her with the beam saber early on, it kind of fizzles as it gets close. Mm -hmm. But when she's distracted, it goes through. Mm. So there may be some connection between her new type abilities, between her psyche and the Psycho Gundam's capabilities, including its beam defense field. And then when she gets back to the Sudori right after this fight, what she says to both Namikar and Wooder about how nobody who hasn't piloted the Psycho Gundam can ever understand the experience of piloting it feels a little bit like that theme of generational conflict coming back again. The world is changing and you older people are just completely unprepared to deal with the changing world. You can't even understand the experiences I'm having. You can't hope to tell me how I should be behaving dealing with this scary new technology. It's worth considering she is effectively the expert on piloting the Psycho Gundam. They've never done it. Probably no one else has ever done it. Maybe a test pilot at some point. But she is effectively the expert. And yet they're questioning her tactics. They're questioning what she's done. There are her superiors, but she has the superior knowledge about this specific thing, and yet she still has to you know, be under this other person's command and deal with their questions and their doubts because of her position here. Being the Psycho Gundam's pilot seems like it really sucks. 
at least to hear her tell it. But it also gives her incredible power, and she really revels in that power. Yeah, I don't think it sucked until she had to fight somebody. <laughs> She uh, kind of makes it sound like it sucks all the time. Really? That's the impression I got when she talks about you can't possibly know because you've never piloted it. I suppose. My interpretation was that that was very specific to her actually fighting an enemy. Yeah, we know this was her first ever combat. That feeling of incredible power is really what stands out about the Psycho Gundam more than anything else. The size of it, the strength of it, its hugely powerful beam cannons, the way it just tosses the Mark II around like a rag doll. My impression of her and of the experience of piloting the Psycho Gundam was frankly one of extreme confidence <laughs> right up until she has to contend with Camille's new type abilities. She's laughing to herself as she destroys the city and <laughs> chases the Mark II all over creation. However, she has that line where she compares the Mark II to a doll. It's so small. It's so unable to hurt her. It's ridiculous. She's like, this is the best technology the other side have. This is a joke. But then she keeps repeating the doll line with considerably less certainty when the Nemos show up and she shoots them out of the air. It's unclear if she's killed them, one of them crash lands, but her hand is shaking and hesitating on the controls. For four, talking about them as dolls is a mental coping mechanism to deal with the fact that she's killing people. She needs to think of them as not people to actually kill them. Because for all that she's been trouncing Camille this whole time, She's never seemed particularly close to killing him. He's been able to dodge everything. He can't hurt her, but she she never quite goes in for the kill, really. And here we see she is, in fact, deeply uncomfortable with the idea of killing someone directly. When she's forced to think about it, yeah. I would love to have Dr. Shar come in to talk about Four in this episode, because her talking about these other mobile suits as dolls really does remind me of the way Amuro used to count his kills during battle. They're not people, they're just scores. They're not people, they're dolls. She has a similar line the first time Camille challenges her about her decision to fight in the middle of the city. He says, you know, we could have fought anywhere. Why did it have to be here with all of these innocent civilians around who, although we don't see them once the battle starts, we don't see people being killed during the battle, we can presume it's happening. We see collapsed buildings. We see explosions in a city that big with that many people. It would have been impossible to get everyone out in time. And what she says in response to this is, this is war. Full stop, no further explanation. You notice Amuro agrees with her. Amuro, in observing the fight, can tell that Camille is maybe trying to move the battle away from the center of the city and is you know, shouting into the ether because he's backseat fighting. <laughs> you don't have time for that. <laughs> but for her, characterizing this as war gives her permission to do anything. It gives her a kind of moral blank check where she doesn't have to feel bad about anything she's doing in the exercise of this incredible power. It's kind of a big gamble for Four to go out and start wrecking Hong Kong on the assumption that the AU forces are going to send mobile suits out to stop her. And specifically the Mark II. Yeah, they are under no obligation to protect Hong Kong. It's a neutral city, and so the decision to send Camille is mostly just a Yug, like, playing the hero in a way that A, the Titans had no reason to expect a Yug would, and B, kind of makes Four and company seem almost cartoonishly villainous. Aha! We'll threaten these innocent civilians in order to draw out the heroes now! Ha ha ha! But it clearly does work, and if she had attacked the Audumla instead, then she'd be fighting the Audumla in the harbor rather than the Mark II in the city. True. Did it occur to you that this scene is in fact very similar to the very first battle Camille experiences on Green Noah? With Quattro justifying the risk to civilians as this is war, and Camille, well, Camille and other residents of the colony feeling frustrated that the fight has to happen in the middle of where they live because they could have put a base anywhere. They didn't have to put it in the middle of a residential area. The design of the Psycho Gundam is pretty interesting, isn't it? Eh, it's a big black machine. 
Yes, it is a gigantic black mobile suit, or technically a mobile armor. I don't know. It's a mobile suit. Don't let the official sources lie to you about that. I honestly didn't notice the design all that much except for a couple of things, the Gundamness of it. It's like, oh, yep, that's very distinctly a Gundam. I thought it seemed rather leggy proportionally, and just the sheer scale of it, that when it's in its fortress mode, it can't get through a city street without the sides of it scraping into the buildings. When it's in its mobile suit mode, it's the height of a very tall skyscraper. I think the Mark II comes up just past its ankle, maybe to its <laughs> knee maximum. I don't think it makes it to the knee. The difference in scale is so immense. And I'm sure they construct those scenes so that we can feel that. So that we can see the Mark II standing in an alleyway next to its foot. So that we can see the Mark II clinging to its little head-like protrusion. <laughs> totally dwarfed by the immensity of the whole thing. And how similar is that to the fight earlier between Amaro and the muscle at Luo and Company, who both stand at least a foot taller than him and are able to pick him up with one hand so that his feet dangle on the ground? Amaro gets some of his own back. He only loses because he was outnumbered. Camille manages to win the fight. Camille manages a draw. We get introduced to Namikar Cornell, who we are told is the lead instructor at the Murasame lab, but she seems so milk toast. <laughs> she's afraid of heights. She's like crouched and clinging to the railing as they get pulled up into the Sudori. Every time Four says something unconventional, her reaction is very, oh my stars. It's a little <laughs> bit like a parent whose toddler has said something inappropriate. Like, Four, don't talk like that to your superior officer. Like, who is this woman who clearly has no control over her student, subject, subordinate? Eh? She seems like a pretty nice counterpart to Wooder. There's just nothing there yet. Oh, I think the milk toastness is something. It just seems odd that someone like that would be able to be the lead instructor of a bunch of cyber new types, all of whom we've seen so far are very strong willed and seem rather difficult to control. Well, she must have some way of controlling them. Bell Torchka has no sense of boundaries. <laughs> At least she's not doing any inappropriate touching. Well, mm, yeah, sure she is. After she approaches Camille to make the uh, completely unwelcome and inappropriate guilt trip that he should be giving up the Mark II for Amaro... When he tries to leave, she grabs him by the shoulders. I guess that's true. And he like shakes her off really quickly, throws her hand away. He, yeah, he swings his arm around and she's like, oh, Camille, how could you hit me? It's like, <laughs> excuse me, he was trying to leave and you grabbed him. And then he strands her yeah, in the Mark II's cockpit. That was awesome. Hops in the little elevator and boop. Yeah, Amro didn't ask her for this. We know he's had a few thoughts of like, mm, how could they give that kid the Gundam and not give me the Gundam? But he seems mostly over it. Since he got into the Rictias, there's never been any sense that he wanted the Mark II. And the whole thing is just so manipulative and gross. Yeah. She hasn't talked to Hayato about this. She hasn't talked to Amaro about this. She goes to Camille because he's young and vulnerable and she thinks she can manipulate him. She's wrong. But it's hard even for me to understand what she's trying to get out of this. Besides the obvious trying to get Amaro into the Mark II, like what is her end goal for this? And that's only complicated because her behavior throughout the rest of the episode doesn't really match or shed any additional light on this earliest scene. As I mentioned last episode, I'm not sure she's clear on what she wants from Amaro. She has conflicting desires, right? She wants to see him be the hero, and that's one reason to put him in the Mark II. That Gundam is obviously the hero Gundam, and the hero should be in it, not you, child. You can't possibly be a hero. You're just a child. On the other hand, she didn't want him to be a coward. She wanted him to go out there and fight. But now he's fighting, and she's terrified for his physical safety. She's falling for him, and she is so scared that something is going to happen to him. Oh, yeah. She's terrified of abandonment. And so she probably thinks the Mark II is safer. We know it has better armor. Uh, you know, she thinks Amuro would be safer in there. Maybe. I do think a big question hangs over Amuro throughout this whole episode, and that's what's next for him? 
now that he has awoken from his slumber, gotten back into the mobile suit and started to join the struggle, what is he going to do? Who is he going to be? I love the conversation between Mirai, well, Mirai, Amaro, and Beltorchka, and then later just Mirai and Beltorchka. Mirai mentions that she and Bright want to raise their children in space. This is something that's very important to them and that they are eager to do, which is already interesting. Mirai then asks Amaro, will he also be going back into space? Which he pointedly doesn't answer. He starts to answer. He gets as far as, I'm... He looks at Beltorchka and he changes the <laughs> subject. Then at the end of the episode, we have Beltorchka talking to Mirai about Bright being in space. And, oh, well, it's all very well for him that he gets to work out his frustrations and live his dreams, you know, out in space. But it's hard to be the wife left behind. And this all feels like a proxy for her and Amaro, right? Beltorchka is really talking about her potential future with Amaro. She's not really talking about Bright and Mirai. Yeah, but she's also mixing in her feelings about her own absent parents, absent because they were killed. Because she's also talking about how isn't it really hard on the kids growing up with their father in space? Right. Isn't it better for them to have both of their parents? And she clearly resents Mirai's position. <laughs> Mirai's position essentially being like, Bright and I trust each other and we know each other so well that I'm able to kind of be Bright for the kids, to make it like Bright is here alongside me. Which she describes in almost psychic terminology. Like, I reflect Bright's presence into their minds so that they can have the experience of him there as well. But what she's really saying is that their father doesn't need to be physically present to be a presence in their lives. But that for that to happen, she and Bright have to have this very close understanding and trust. Without that understanding and trust, she would not be able to sort of keep him present for the kids in the way that she does. And this seems to make Beltorchka angry. So angry. She gets her little eye twitch. I love that she has, <laughs> she does this every time she gets mad. Her eyes narrow and kind of flicker. But Beltorchka, if you don't want to hear Mirai talking about parent stuff, don't ask her more questions about parent stuff. This is a conversation you initiated. Well, and what she says about this is, that sounds like the sort of excuse parents would use. What did you expect Mirai was going to do? Throw up her hand and go, you're right, I've been a horrible mother. This also sets up some potential conflict between Beltorchka and Amuro, though. Because we see that Beltorchka does not look at things the way Mirai does. Beltorchka believes that uh, a husband and wife should absolutely be together, be living in the same place, never be separated. And she has shown no indication of a desire or even a willingness to go into space. Hey, that's the same conflict that split Amuro's parents up. Ooh. Um, yeah, it is. And here's Amuro hemming and hawing about, maybe I'll go, maybe I won't go. I'm not certain, which must terrify her even more. <laughs> because if he were clear that he was going, she could break up with him or at least make herself amenable to the idea. And if he were definitely not going, then she wouldn't have to worry about it. But when he can't tell her one way or the other, then it's just the fear. And I may be reading too much into this, but I also get a sense that Beltorchka resents there being people around who know Amaro better than she does. Like when he first spots Mirai and it's clear they're old friends, she looks unhappy about that. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this woman? Who are these children? How do you know them? If you were wondering, I no longer think that Beltorchka gets to be the voice of the show. Just for that one episode. She has been demoted to the status of regular character, real person, with all the flaws and foibles that implies. Later on in the episode, we get Amaro's conversation with Stephanie. Which, again, draws a parallel between Amaro and Quattro. Because Amaro's there doing his backseat battling. <laughs> no, Camille, those are the wrong tactics. What are you doing, you fool? And Stephanie is you know, groaning over this, that he's just another soldier. All he can talk about is tactics. He's like, well, it's natural to think about that when you're watching a battle. It's different for you. You're being sucked into it. And from your perspective, you can't see what's really going on. Right. That's the important part of this conversation. She says, you can't get the full picture your way. And Amaro's reaction is defensive. I'm a pilot. What's wrong with that? Which again, look for a moment at what Hayato has done. Hayato is not out there in a mobile suit anymore. Hayato is in charge. And that means he's not in the thick of the fight. It means he's commanding. 
And theoretically, that is what some super experienced guys like Quattro and Amro should do. They should not be in the thick of the fight. They should be helping run the show. That they should be taking the bigger view into account. Stepping back so that they can provide the guidance, the strategy, the big picture stuff. And they both completely reject this. They don't want it. They have no interest in it. They reject it outright as a possibility. That's all definitely true for Quattro. But for Amaro, none of that has solidified yet. That may be his natural impulse. It might be what he wants. It might be what's easiest for him or most comfortable for him. But he is taken aback. He does seriously consider what Stephanie tells him. And you can tell that they have that moment of connection because of the way the animation shifts there. It's not exactly like the way new type connections are usually depicted, but that sudden change in the way they're both animated does suggest something's happening. Right, that this is a very important exchange. They both get much sharper shadows across their faces is what it looks like. And like black shadows, very dark. And I think they're backlit, which is a little bit like the glow that Four gets. And we know he thinks about all of this seriously because later when he's talking to Camille, he mentions it again. He mentions to Camille, it's easier to see the situation on Earth from outer space. It's easier to judge what's happening from outside it. He's been thinking about it. <laughs> I love the moment when he's talking to Camille about getting Camille back out into space soon. And Camille is like, why are you trying to get rid of me? And Amro's like, I just can't stand to watch you fight like that. <laughs> ha ha ha, JK. <laughs> JK, but not really. I really did hate watching you fight like that. It was bad. I hated it. It's like nails on a chalkboard. However, Amuro also acknowledges that Camille is manifesting some abilities, some power. He had that same sensation of the enemy that Amuro and Mirai had. And that's a sign that with development, Camille could be a really exceptional, valuable pilot. And then things get real philosophical. So let's try to figure out what we think this means. Zamora says to Camille, don't make the mistake I did. This thing called gravity has a way of dragging your soul into the depths of Earth. To which Camille responds, but isn't it Earth that gave us our souls? And maybe it's not an answer to anything. Maybe it's a series of posed questions. Because when you think about a future that involves big chunks of humanity living out in outer space, you do wonder, like, is Earth, is the planet part of what makes us human? Are we still human beings without our ties to the Earth? What does it mean to be a human who's not tied to the Earth? What does it mean to be human, period? And what does it tell us that Amaro feels this pull and thinks it's a problem, but Camille observes it and sees the good in it? Camille does not yet feel that pull, I don't think. And it also feels very much when Camille says, isn't it Earth that gave us our souls? Like he's repeating something back that he heard somewhere. Well, Camille is too young, too inexperienced to really have an answer to this. But I wonder where he heard that from, because he certainly did not hear that from Quattro. School. He was indoctrinated. <laughs> One could see it as a justification for the Ayug and Karaba interest in preserving the Earth. It's not difficult to draw a philosophical connection between the desire to preserve the Earth, its ecology, its environment, and the sense of it being the sort of cradle of human civilization in a metaphysical, religious sense. This conversation sets up a kind of contrasting dualism, where you have the idea of the human soul flying free versus the human soul being a kind of outgrowth of the natural world, out of the soil. This distinction between freedom and independence versus interconnectedness and rootedness is something we've seen in a bunch of characters before, most notably between Shaquatro and Amaro, with Quatro representing the freedom of the soul, independence from obligations, freedom from gravity, and Amaro being more tied down, tied to the people around him, and now explicitly tied to Earth and to gravity. And yet, Quattro is the one who comes back because past to Jupiter, he cannot hear Lala. And not for nothing, Lala is the one who 
when she confronts Amuro for the first time, is horrified that he can fight so well when he has no homeland to fight for. There's an implication that Amuro was at his strongest when he didn't have that rootedness, when he didn't have a place that was home. He had people, he had a, a ship, but that's not quite the same as a planet. <laughs> and what does Lala represent to him now? Ever since that elevator conversation between Amuro and Shar, when Shar accused Amuro of being afraid to go back into space because he was afraid of seeing Lala again, it has seemed that Lala continues to represent something important for Amuro, something that scares him, and perhaps something that is standing in opposition to Beltorchka now. Lala calls Amuro to space, Beltorchka pulls him towards Earth. In that elevator conversation, Shar suggests that what lies for Amuro in space is what he needs to do, the things that he needs to do in his life, which sounds a lot like his destiny. But in a very broad, like fulfilling your purpose as a human being kind of way. Because something we've touched on a little bit in the past, I think, and that is still relevant, is when they talk about gravity holding people down in the Universal Century, in the two shows that we've watched so far, it seems very likely that there is a connection to simply the idea of getting older. Because it's not uncommon, I imagine, in most societies to talk about the fact that you know, as you get older, you lose freedom and you gain responsibilities. You have a lease or a mortgage. You have relationships. You have a job. You develop all of these entanglements. You accumulate stuff. All of which are things that limit your ability to just like float <laughs> freely through the world. You can't just up and leave the way you could when you were 18 and you didn't own anything and you didn't have a job or any relationships to tie you down. And while I don't think that's all of it, I do think that is a big part of what's at play here. We basically don't hear anybody young talk about Earth's gravity holding them down <laughs> or, or hear anybody young talked about in that way. I would argue that Beltorchka maybe applies, but she's a special case. Hmm. I think there are certainly spiritual elements as well, but I think some of it is just the practical uh, entanglements and responsibilities of getting older. But Quattro, Char, who has always had a flair for the dramatic and who has always leaned hard on the abstract side of things, is basically gesturing around at all of Amuro's life and saying, this is all just stuff, man. Your real obligations lie in space. That's where you'll do the great things. It's almost like a call to the priesthood. It's like abandon all your worldly attachments and pursue the truly significant goals. Yeah. Given Quattro's attitude about personal relationships for himself, not a bad comparison <laughs> when he talks about how, like, oh, I never married because it's a soldier's life for me. Like, I don't know how to be if I'm not a soldier. And he has a nice apartment with some looted art, but he doesn't give any indication of liking it or having any reluctance to leave it. One gets the impression he is almost never there. This is all just stuff, man. He has the same attitude towards his mobile suits, especially in First Gundam, where he was exchanging them right and left. And he certainly had no compunctions about dropping the Rikdias first for a Mark II and then for the Hyakushiki. Yeah, it's quite interesting, actually, compared to everyone else, for all that people start to identify him with a particular machine, he doesn't seem to feel personal attachment. He's not lovingly caring for the Hyakushiki in the way that Camille is caring for the Mark II. Or in the way that Amuro obsessed over the Gundam. It's hard to imagine Quattro ever designing his own mobile suit or developing upgrades for it or putting that kind of time, attention, and care into it. It makes him seem a little bit like a mad prophet. Like he has this burning soul within him that is driven to some purpose. And everything around him, all the stuff, even his own body or his representational body in the case of the mobile suits, is just dust. We almost make him sound admirable, and I don't think he is, but I do think he is the most detached from all of this, of any of our characters. And this final scene between Amuro and Camille is the show asking, is that really admirable? It doesn't offer an answer, only the question. I think the show presents us with some obvious upsides and downsides to both positions. Because <laughs> Tomino is tired of us asking him to tell us what to think. <laughs> And
And now our research. First, Hong Kong, and then brain-computer interfaces. As Tom put it, Hong Kong feels like one of the characters in this episode. And so I wanted to touch on Hong Kong's history and the state of affairs in Hong Kong in the 1980s. And because apparently Zeta knew what the significant world events would be in 2019, I will wrap up by talking about how that history ties to the current situation in Hong Kong. Yay, current events. Woo! It was so much fun when we talked about the Amazon being on fire. The physical area that we now call Hong Kong became part of China during the Qin Dynasty. It remained sparsely populated for a long time. Hilly and relatively barren, locals depended on salt production, pearl harvesting, and fishing. But from as early as the Mongol invasion in the 13th century, Hong Kong has been a place of refuge for people fleeing violence, famine, natural disasters, political turmoil, and civil war on the mainland. It was during the First Opium War, in 1841 to be precise, that Great Britain first invaded Hong Kong, initially for use as a military staging ground. When China lost the war, it was forced to cede Hong Kong to Great Britain as part of the Treaty of Nanking, and Hong Kong became a crown colony of the British Empire. Crown colonies are dependencies, overseen by a governor who is appointed by the British Parliament. There were some local officials in the Hong Kong government, but they were all appointed by Great Britain. None were selected by the local population. During the colonial period, Hong Kong became a modern city with gas and electric utilities, trams, airlines, hospitals, local banking, and more educational opportunities, albeit mostly Western-style education and Uh, It was essentially expected that for university-level education, you would leave Hong Kong. (laughs) It was mostly shielded from the social and political turmoil of the fall of the Qing Empire on the mainland, but Hong Kong saw plenty of turmoil of its own. There was a rebellion against the colonial government in 1899, and an outbreak of bubonic plague in 1894 was used to justify imposing racial segregation in Hong Kong's zoning laws. In 1860, at the end of the Second Opium War, Great Britain received a perpetual lease on the Kowloon Peninsula, an area of the mainland directly across the strait from Hong Kong Island. They were concerned about the security of the port city and wanted an additional buffer zone between the Hong Kong port and mainland China. Then, in 1898, the British and Chinese governments signed the Second Convention of Peking, part of which was a 99-year lease agreement for what is called the New Territories, more than 200 small islands surrounding Hong Kong. So you'll hear people refer to Hong Kong, to Kowloon, to the New Territories. All of this is called Hong Kong now, but people also refer to the specific individual parts separately, depending. It made the reading confusing. (laughs) The population boomed in the early 1900s, up to 1.6 million people, from the approximately 7,500 people who lived on Hong Kong Island in 1841. Hong Kong was occupied by Japan during the Second World War. The attack began just eight hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor, and the surrender was on December 25, 1941, Black Christmas. The occupation was the first time in decades that Hong Kong lost population. Executions, famine, and deportation lessened the population to only 600,000 people. Many of those deported had only recently come to Hong Kong, fleeing the Second Sino-Japanese War, which had begun in 1937. But after the liberation of Hong Kong, the population boomed again. Thousands of refugees went to Hong Kong from the mainland during both the Communist Revolution in 1949 and the Great Leap Forward in the late 50s and early 60s. The post-war period saw Hong Kong serve as an important transshipment port between the rest of the world and China. A transshipment port is a sort of intermediary port. It's not the final destination for most of the goods that arrive there, but a place for shipments of merchandise to be imported, stored, and traded before continuing on. I was going to ask. (laughs) The influx of labor from the mainland also turned Hong Kong into an industrial and manufacturing center, and many companies that had been headquartered on the mainland before the war moved their main offices to Hong Kong. The 50s also mark the beginning of the now-iconic high-rises, built to provide housing to a burgeoning population in an area where outward expansion of the city is basically impossible. Like in much of the rest of the world, the 1960s were a period of social upheaval for Hong Kong. Communist, nationalist, and anti-colonial protesters led riots and planted bombs, and traditional family structures were strained by the new work culture that saw most workers spending more time in factories than at home. Low wages and poor working conditions contributed to widespread discontent. 
Then the 1970s were marked by improvements in the standard of living, rising salaries, improved life expectancy, higher rates of literacy, and so on, fueled by labor legislation, government housing projects, and public works programs. There was a largely successful effort to battle police corruption and the passing of legislation to require equal pay and benefits for women in the workforce. By the 1980s, Hong Kong had become one of the Asian tiger economies, a global finance leader, and the economy began to shift away from manufacturing and toward banking and finance, trade, logistics, and communications. There continued to be an influx of immigrants, mostly undocumented, from mainland China. These were the boom years for Hong Kong cinema, which had been around since the turn of the century but started to receive more international attention during this time. However, the early 80s also saw increasing unease over the impending handover of the least new territories. And it was on December 1984 when the Sino-British Joint Declaration was signed. It included an agreement that when the 99-year lease on the new territories expired, Britain would return not only the new territories, but Kowloon and Hong Kong as well. In return, China would implement a one-country, two-systems policy, retaining capitalism and certain political freedoms in Hong Kong for a period of 50 years. Freedom of speech, assembly, press, and religion, notably, which were not part of life on the mainland. Britain could have attempted to retain control of Hong Kong and Kowloon, but decided that it wouldn't have been logistically or politically feasible. Hong Kong's airport, for instance, was in the least portion of the territory, and about half of Hong Kong's population lived there. Plus, the Chinese government had made clear that it did not consider the earlier unequal treaties enforceable. They considered all of Hong Kong to be Chinese territory. The preferences of the local Hong Kongers were not consulted, and they didn't really have options. If they tried for independence, they would have just been invaded. And ultimately, the UK did not provide Hong Kongers with full UK passports or the right to live in the UK. This caused a wave of emigration, as many Hong Kongers concerned about the handover moved to the UK, the United States, Canada, Australia, uh, essentially any non-communist country. And this is the state of affairs in Hong Kong that our Zeta writers would have been familiar with. I tried to find information specifically about the black market in Hong Kong's economy, but most of the search results are aimed at tourists, people who want to buy knockoff designer handbags and so on. Still, this tells us a lot. We have the bit about the anti-corruption efforts, that they went from having an incredibly corrupt government and police force to, within some period of time, having one of the least corrupt in the world, but that it was enough of a problem that action was being taken in the 70s, probably, I'm sure, into the 80s as well. That's not a problem that fixes itself terribly quickly. As we mentioned in the episode, that kind of corruption can contribute to a sense of not knowing who your friends are, which Stephanie Wooman mentions. Also, Hong Kong's position as a transshipment port would certainly lend itself to smuggling and black market activities. Plus, the presence of a lot of refugees and undocumented immigrants and people trying to emigrate. So people trying to get both in and out, depending on their situation. Making it a kind of transshipment port, but for people. And Zeta is 85, 86. And so they would have been hearing about the tens of thousands of people in Hong Kong leaving every year. Desperate to get out. Really frightened of what was going to happen. The ones who, because of Britain's decision not to automatically give them full UK passports and the right to live in the UK might have needed forged papers or other travel documents. Or someone who could expedite papers for them, or basically desperate to make any sort of other arrangements so that they could leave. The handover happened in July 1997. I'm sure many of you remember hearing about it. I was young, but remember it featuring prominently in the news. And even before the handover, there was some contention over what one country, two systems meant in practice. In the lead-up to the handover, there were pushes to increase democracy in Hong Kong that the Chinese government reacted to with trade restrictions and threats to fire any democratically elected officials once the handover came. They eased up on that by the time 1997 rolled around, but the strain has been on and off ever since, and we continue to see it now. The current unrest has a lot of contributing factors, but the incendiary spark was a proposal that would have allowed the Chinese government to extradite people to the mainland. And you can imagine the damper that puts on things like freedom of speech, religion, and the press. And just as the handover hung like a cloud over Hong Kong in the 80s and 90s, now Hong Kong is faced with the question of 
What happens when its 50 years are up in 2047? After watching the episode, we were curious whether Zeta Gundam's depiction of Hong Kong felt real to people familiar with the city. So we put the question out to our followers on Twitter, and we got quite a few responses. Of those who responded, about 15% said yes, it was. 30% said no. But the majority of respondents told us that while the depiction of Hong Kong in Zeta Gundam doesn't look or feel the way Hong Kong does now, it is pretty accurate to the way Hong Kong used to look and feel. We first encountered an obvious brain-controlled device when the Bra Bro mobile armor appeared in First Gundam's episode 33, Farewell Inside Six. Although we would not discover its revolutionary Saikomu control system until it reappeared in episode 39, the new type, Shalia Bowl. Saikomu is a portmanteau of psychic and communicator, and Saikomu directed weapons would appear in every first Gundam episode after that. The Elmeth in episodes 40 and 41, the Zeong in episodes 42 and 43. All of these explicitly relied on the extraordinary mental faculties of new types. Shalia Bol, Lala Soon, and Shar Aznable. Yet, despite the prevalence of new types and cyber new types in Zeta, we haven't seen any brain controlled weapons until now. From the dialogue and the events of the episode, we can be certain that the Psycho Gundam incorporates a Psychomu system and is at least partly controlled by the pilot's brain. Honestly, the name was a pretty big hint. We are also told that only four can pilot the Psycho Gundam and we see that doing so is both unpleasant and difficult for her. The Saikamu is what we would today call a brain-computer interface. This is a general term for a variety of different practical, experimental, and theoretical technologies that allow human and animal brains to exchange signals with computers and through those signals control an external device. As a technology, these are still very much in their infancy. But there is also exciting and incredible work being done on them as we speak. Like a lot of the technology in Gundam, the Saikomu is a mixture of what was nascent real science at the time when the show was made and some science fiction speculation about how it might develop. The helmets that both Shalia and Lala wear while controlling their mobile armors were probably inspired by the electroencephalograph, or EEG, a device for passively monitoring brain activity via electrode sensors placed on the scalp. The first successful use of an EEG on a human was in 1924, and in the next 50-odd years, investigators studying the workings of the brain figured out that, with training, a person hooked up to an EEG can consciously produce certain brain activity. With the right signal processing and calibration, the EEG can interpret that activity, and send a command to a connected device. In 1964, before the term brain-computer interface existed, experimental music composer Alvin Lussier developed a machine that allowed a performer to play about half a dozen percussion instruments at the same time via EEG. And yes, there is video of this in action, and it's in the show notes. The term brain-computer interface was then proposed in the mid-70s, but the first functional interfaces did not appear until the early 90s. So in 1985, when Zeta aired, this was all firmly in the realm of theoretical science. Some of the earliest experiments involved monkeys learning how to control a robotic arm that they would use to feed themselves chunks of fruit and marshmallow. Marshmallow, really? Yep. <laughs> and in recent years, humans have managed to move virtual cursors, spell out words at a rate of about five characters per minute, and control robotic arms. It's unclear if they ever used those robotic arms to feed themselves fruits and marshmallows, but, I mean, wouldn't you? Today, you can find a whole range of consumer-priced toys and games that allow you to control everything from a video game to a rudimentary helicopter via an EEG headband. The U.S. military has even invested in research into methods for sending signals from one brain-computer interface to another during combat. It's telepathy by way of science. None of this stuff is reliable or portable enough yet for a widespread adoption in normal life. We might still be decades away from practical implementation, but the theoretical groundwork is there, and it's not that far of a conceptual leap from what we have today to something like the Elmeth's bits. 
brain-computer interfaces don't just work one way. Signals can be sent out by the brain, but they can also be sent into the brain by the computer. This can be part of controlling an external device. For example, electrical stimulation in the correct part of the brain, while you're using a robot arm, could provide something like the neural feedback that you feel when using a biological limb. Brain-computer interfaces can be used to circumvent damaged parts of the brain, to allow two healthy sections to communicate via the interface, or to simulate the function of sensory organs. There's even research into how stimulation of the brain can enhance a healthy brain's ability to learn and improve memory. But there are problems. Of course, there are problems. And they can be divided into A, practical problems, and B, ethical problems. The practical problems revolve mostly around the mechanics of the interface itself. The EEG, with electrodes planted on the skull, is the easiest and least invasive way to interface with the brain. But that comes with a significant downside. The quality of the signal received is relatively poor. After all, all the bits of your head that protect your brain, up to and including that thick plate of bone that is your skull, those naturally muffle the signals that the EEG needs to monitor. On the other end of the spectrum, the most accurate way to monitor neuron activity is an intracortical microarray. This is a tiny device that is surgically implanted into the brain matter itself and can monitor the activation of individual neurons. Wow. Besides the difficulty and risk of the initial neurosurgery and the whole implanting sensors directly into your brain matter part, these intracortical microarrays tend to lose function over time as the brain rejects the foreign object, gradually forming a sheaf of scar tissue around the microarray that, on the one hand, blocks signals from reaching the sensor, and on the other hand, kills brain cells in the area. The third option is electrocorticography, or ECOG, and it's essentially an average of the good and bad points of the other two. You can think of ECOG as like an EEG, but it's placed on the surface of the brain instead of on the scalp. So it's still invasive, because you do still get under the skull, but nothing is getting implanted into the brain matter itself. That means there's less contact and less risk of scar tissue forming. But there is still some risk of scar tissue forming, even if the damage is likely to be less severe. The quality of the signal is not nearly as good as the intracortical microarray, and you can't monitor single neurons. But getting underneath the skull does make it much more responsive than an EEG, there are some experimental wireless versions of these different interfaces, but at the moment, generally speaking, to make one of these work, you do need to have wires coming out of the back of your skull attached to a supercomputer. So not very portable or practical or reliable at the moment. In one tragic incident that illustrates these challenges and also sounds like it came straight out of fiction rather than real life, in the early 2000s, 16 patients who had all lost their vision received intracortical brain implants that gave them partial simulated vision. And they worked. But then the scientist responsible for the implants died, without anyone to take over his project, and without having documented his work. Oh my god. And then the implants started to fail. After about eight weeks of sight, the patients lost their simulated vision, this time for good. When did you say that was? In the early 2000s. I heard about this. It was in but 2004. I, I heard about it before it messed up. Yeah. <laughs> How heartbreaking. Yeah. I thought of it because in the article I remember reading is the whole thing about how it, it took them a while for their brains to learn to process the new information because it wasn't coming from their eyes. Yeah. So it's it was like, like, a, it's like a camera pumping it into some different part of their brain. Right, it's visual, but it was coming from a different place. And so it it took some adaptation for their brain to understand the input, but it was working. Mm -hmm. That's actually a really important uh, factor, is that adaptation time, training. Mm -hmm. And that'll come back in a minute. But as for the ethical problems, well, even in their relatively rudimentary state today, brain-computer interfaces can already be used to kind of see what someone else is seeing. And researchers investigating security vulnerabilities have shown that even consumer-grade EEGs used to play video games can be used to retrieve sensitive information, like PIN numbers and bank information, even from an unwitting user. So extra disturbing. And if you can stimulate memory, 
Could you manipulate it? Could you inhibit it? Could you use a brain computer interface to take someone's memories away? Or perhaps to make them relive the same nightmarish vision of the sky falling every single night? And then there's the issue of intent and action. We all restrain ourselves from doing or saying things, but we still think about them. Maybe even we think through the words or imagine the actions. Would a direct link from thought and action bypass that sense of self-restraint? Would it make us more impulsive, more inclined to lash out when angered? Perhaps we would need to train our minds so that we are always in control of our own impulsive thoughts. It might feel a bit like trying to control a snake that is writhing around inside your skull. That would be pretty unpleasant, and probably pretty draining. And it brings me to one of the other downsides of brain-computer interfaces, which is something Nina touched on earlier. They take training to use, you have to adapt to them, and they can be exhausting. Cognitive load, or mental load, is the amount of strain placed on the brain by any given action. A simple action like reaching out to pick up an apple produces relatively little mental load when compared to a complex action like remembering the individual calendars of a four-person family. And unfamiliar tasks produce more mental load than familiar ones. And likewise, doing a familiar task in an unfamiliar way. Mental load has long been a factor in, for example, developing prosthetics, because more complex multifunctional prosthetics also require more complex control methods that can produce exhausting levels of mental load. One such design for a prosthetic arm developed in the early 1970s allowed the arm and hand to be elevated, extended, and rotated, but it was controlled by elevation and protraction of the user's two shoulders. It was a complex system with a high mental load that required plenty of training. Although, children did take to it much more naturally than adults. Likewise for brain-computer interfaces. The act of controlling a device with your brain waves is both unfamiliar and complex. The operator needs to be trained to use the interface. And the younger they are when they start, the easier it will be for the action to become natural. And the machine needs to be calibrated to the operator so that it can filter out the noise and only pick up the intentional commands. That might explain why only four can pilot the Psycho Gundam. Its Psychomu is calibrated specifically to her, and she has been trained to use it, almost like a part of her own body. But why is it that only new types can use the Psychomu? The device is pretty clearly inspired by the theoretical brain-computer interfaces imagined in the 70s and 80s, and those can be used by any old human, or even monkey. Well, we know that within the Universal Century itself, there is one key functional difference. The Psychomu is not detecting brain activity via electrical activity the way all real-world interfaces do. It can't be, because of the Minovsky particles. They interfere with unshielded electromagnetic signals. And the whole advantage of the LMATH's bits was that they could be controlled at distance regardless of Minovsky particle interference. And yes, I know where the Gundam science is eventually going to go with all of this, don't at me, but my point is that even at this very early moment, just from what we've seen so far, what we know about how the real-world brain-computer interfaces work, and what we know about Minovsky particles in the Universal Century, the only logical possibility is that new type brains emit some other kind of signal. And that also explains why 4 doesn't need sensors all over her scalp or an implant with wires coming out of the back of her skull. If the new type signal isn't blocked by Minovsky particles, then maybe it's not blocked by your skull either. The new type helmets from First Gundam might have been necessary when the Psychomu was more rudimentary, but now 4 can control the Psycho Gundam just by being inside it. And perhaps that connection goes both ways, too. Next time, on episode 2.19, A Fateful Encounter, we cover Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam episode 18 and... Yoi Chansu! But everywhere is a battle zone! Mama Bear! We're jumping onto... Dodai! What does the scent of a woman have to do with anything? Releasing the Kraken! Big Bro Camille, Best Camille! Crippling headaches, near drownings, and other awkward first date moments. Someone nothing like Amaro, and when it comes to saving moms from the Titans, 
Second time's the charm. <laughs> you will see the tears of time. Aw, oh, you didn't use my best one. Which one? Hathaway's Splash. Huh? People on the internet will appreciate my genius. Yes, they will. That's true. <laughs> Remember to do all of the podcast things. Subscribe and review Mobile Suit Breakdown wherever you get your podcasts. Then pledge your undying devotion to Mobile Suit Breakdown on Patreon, where you can find great bonus content, get access to the MSB Discord, get exclusive MSB merchandise, and, you know, support the podcast. You can also follow at Gundam Podcast on Twitter and Instagram, and like us at facebook.com slash Gundam Podcast for all kinds of extra content. And you should always check out our website, GundamPodcast.com, for all of our episodes, show notes, watch list, wish list, some other lists, and more. Plus, you can always email your questions, comments, and complaints to GundamPodcast at gmail.com. Or just shout your wrong Gundam opinions to us in person by coming to scenic New York City and yelling, elegant and powerful, the design of the Psycho Gundam is among Zeta's best on any busy street corner. We will totally hear you. The intro song is Wasp by Misha Dioxin, and the closing music is Long Way Home by Spinning Ratio. You can find links and more in the show notes. And thank you for listening. It bit the camera. <laughs>took us some work but we got there in the end yep my family has a robot to do that thank you very much gateway to the stars of course he insisted we do other non-regular episodes <laughs> to fill that buffer you know it's a working vacation Over frog, over fog shrouded hickory. Frog shadow, <laughs> frog shrouded hickory. Frog shadowed hickory. There's an enormous frog <laughs> casting its shadow over all of hickory. What is the literary symbolism of that? Really. It sounds very sexual. <laughs> it sounded sexual in the show too. I know, but it like <laughs> sounds even more sexual here. <laughs> Limit you emails. Too bad. <laughs> cool. Love when they do that. Oh yeah, so great. In case it's not clear from our tone of voice, it's not great. <laughs> Leaf blowers, true enemy of podcasters. Die.